Make sure to subscribe to Ben on YouTube so you can stay up to date on everything humble. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Data and the Drama Show with your boy, Ben Humble. So without further ado, I want to bring on somebody. Um, you know, I got connected recently with this person and I, I looked into the backstory before connecting and I'm like, man, this is powerful. Somebody who started, who left security, who left safety, who left comfort to start and was incredibly successful. So I want to bring on uh, a new friend of mine, Mr. Brandon Dawson to the show. Brandon, welcome to the Data and Drama Show, my friend. Thanks, Ben. Glad to be here. Yeah, glad to have you here, man. I'm, I'm excited to dive into your story, and there's a lot of different things we can touch on. Uh, why don't we just start, perhaps, just give folks a quick idea of what's going on with you today before we kind of dive into your story a bit. Well, I'm Grant Cardone's business partner, and we've been spending our weeks with thousands of business owners, uh, helping them navigate uh, these tough, choppy seas uh, over the last few months. Um, and so I've just been dedicated and committed to, to talking to thousands of business owners and doing everything I can to help them, uh, not only survive, but in some cases, uh, thrive and, and then be prepared for the bounce back, uh, hmm. so that they can grow and scale their business. I love it. Something I like about you is counsel is that you're a practitioner of the stuff you talk about because you've already grown and exited the company, which is just phenomenal. And that'll be the, uh, That'll be the growth segment. We could talk about that. But Brandon, would you give us your story, man? I just think you have such a powerful journey. And I would love our audience to just get to know you. Maybe go back to when you were, you know, 26, 27. What, what was that looking like for you, man? Yeah, the, the, the big thing that taught me a lesson was uh, when I was actually 17 and I got grounded for a week. <laughs> and uh, my, I was working at a busboy in the evening and doing football practice and going to school in the daytime, and my parents grounded me because I was doing some stuff I shouldn't have been doing. Uh -oh. And uh, we had a, a walnut orchard, and the walnuts paid for us to go to private school, my brothers and I, because my parents didn't have any money. So they depended on getting $5,000 out of that walnut orchard every year for school tuition. Mm -hmm. And so they decided they were going to go out of town, and they told me I had to pick the walnuts up, and I hated these walnuts. Um, <laughs> and so I went to school that, that next Friday, and my parents rolled out of town and I really wanted to go see this girl. Um, and I knew I was stuck. So I went to school and saw a note on the locker that said senior fun drive. And so I pulled that note off and went up and found the senior class president and said, what are you guys doing here? And they said, we want to raise a thousand dollars to go on a senior trip to Bend, Oregon. And it dawned on me, I had an idea. So I said, I tell you what, how about you guys come over and help me pick up walnuts and, and, and then, uh, you know, I'll help contribute towards your thousand dollars. I thought maybe a few people would show up, but they ended up bringing their brothers, their sisters, their mothers, their fathers. And there was like 70 people, 60, 70 people that showed up. And we just, just did what would normally take my whole family a week to do. And for me, it'd take two weeks to do. We did it in three days and the place was just pristine and then all of a sudden, all those family members are like, can we buy the walnuts? And I was a 2.4 GPA high school graduate. I, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't have a f app on my phone to calculate. So I made a number up and they paid me. Well, my parents every year uh, raised $5,500 to put us kids to school. Mm -hmm. I happened to raise 8,800 and pay the thousand dollars because I didn't know how to do the math on the weight of the walnuts. And so I made all this money. I didn't have to get my hands dirty. Mm -hmm. Uh, threw tons of people at the issue. And, and I learned three valuable lessons. The first lesson is uh, the more people you throw at a problem, the faster the problem can get solved. Mm -hmm. Second lesson is price is only an issue in the absence of value. Mm. The value wasn't necessarily the walnuts. The value for these family members was showing their kids that they loved them. And then the third thing is um, that what you do, even if you hate it, could provide the life that you want to have. So how you do it and who you do it with, if you make joy out of that, then it doesn't matter what you do. And I learned to apply those three principles to business that inspired me uh, to always want to be my own guy and do my own thing. So I saved enough money that at 26 with a two and a half year old and a brand new baby that was two weeks old, I quit my job making 150 grand a year, sold everything, moved to a little tiny house from Minnesota to, and to Portland, Oregon. And I went around and met business owners that wanted to retire and try to construct a deal where I could get an option to buy half their business over like two years for me to take the business over and grow it. So then I could pay them out of their other half. They'll, they'll win. I'll, I'll win. 
parlayed that first gig in Canada. Uh, I started out in Vancouver, Canada. Okay, okay, did, okay. Did a deal with a guy there on his $3 million business. And three years later, I was ringing the opening bell of the American Stock Exchange, growing it to $75 million, acquiring 130 businesses and franchises in 900. Dude, I got to give you, you're getting a bomb there, man. That's powerful. We came into Canada in 1991 with nothing but a will to thrive. They risked everything they had, left behind everyone they knew. The only way out of the country was illegal, and the risk was huge. I adopted the mindset that my parents had of faith and vision for my life. You see, they helped me understand that you get to decide what happens in this world. By the age of 30, I became a millionaire. I refused to accept scarcity, limiting beliefs, or someone else's excuses. So you want to know what the secret is? People ask me all the time, what's the secret? You want to know what it's going to take for you to succeed? Here's the truth. Well, just a powerful story, man. And obviously the growth is amazing. The sale is amazing. The numbers are, you know. Yeah, well, that, that, that's not even the... Amazing part that that job I ended up getting fired from my private equity group decided that they wanted to sell the business prematurely and I was just getting ready to just absolutely crush it. I would have made a couple hundred million dollars on that deal. And instead I, 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 I got out with a severance payment for a year and that changed my mentality about how to build and grow and scale businesses. So I reformulated my strategy. I took my last half a million. I launched my own company with no outside investors. Mm. No money. I didn't borrow any money. I just launched my concept in 2004. And between 2004 and 2014, I generated uh, 50 million of profits that grew and scaled the business. And I sold it for 150 million, 77 times EBITDA. And instead of Woo! giving the money to the financial guys, okay. I was able to give 40% of all that money to my customers and my employees. So everybody won. Wow. wow. That's two bombs, 77 times EBITDA. What? I have, I've never heard that valuation, that metric ever thrown around, I think, until I read your story. What an incredible piece. Dude, I got so many questions, man. Just, so uh, let, let's just go back a quick second here. So you stumbled across, let's say, entrepreneurship in a way by essentially, you know, like just getting into it, didn't know the, the, the cost of the product that you were, you were there to collect the, the nuts and so forth. So, so what did that look like for you from, let's say, that age of 17 till 25? Did you develop this ambition for entrepreneurship or what got you into that, to that high paying job? Where was your mindset at those days? I dropped out of So what was happening is, is that happened and then I graduated and then I came up to Portland State mm -hmm. and I started working one afternoon a week selling behind the ear hearing aids to ear doctors as a part time job to make some money. Mm. And I found out very quickly, I was selling more in a half a day a week than the people that were selling the whole week that worked there full time. Mm. And so uh, they had a rep opening, an outside sales rep in North South Carolina and Georgia. And I had never, ever traveled to that region. And so I proposed that I would go there and be a sales rep. I dropped out of college and I moved and I got a company car and I, I and then the day I landed, the rep that had the other six or seven states ended up coming down with, with uh, I forget how you say it, diverticulitis or whatever, some kind of stomach issue. Okay. And they said, dude, you got 11 states. And for two years, I just was in my car driving to those states, just <laughs> hustling pool as a side gig <laughs> and uh, selling products to ear doctors. And then my boss fired me from that job and I was in Atlanta with no car, no family because I'd moved there. And um, I was like, what am I going to do? And, and this dude I hustled pool with said, hey, I have a side gig. I sell ad space on the back of these plastic cards around the universities and then I give them to the university to hand them to the kids. Go knock on doors. I'll give you half of whatever you sell. And I was selling. So I was making more money than I ever imagined making in my life hustling pool and selling uh, ad space for about six or seven months. Then the company that fired me called me back. My boss fired me in Atlanta and said, hey, we got a problem with this guy in Atlanta. We need you to talk to us. And I explained what he was doing. And they said, we want you to come back to the company, but move to Minnesota and become an assistant sales manager. Hmm. And I did that. And I knew that I needed to save up. I, I just knew I needed a year's worth of income and cash 
so that I could leave my job when I wanted to leave my job and go, go do something because I wanted to, after that experience in Atlanta, I'm like, I could do anything. And sometimes, sometimes these disasters where people find themselves in a position where they're like, I lost my job or I don't have any money, the, the, the survival mode would create so much confidence when you survive through that. And that's what happened for me. If I hadn't lost my job and survived and not only survived, but thrived, I might not have had the courage with a brand new baby to quit my job with a, a year's worth of salary, sell everything and have enough money for myself. But I had the confidence that I can survive. And I think, I think that's a instinct that I think everyone should lean into and develop because once you have that confidence that you can make it on your own, you can pretty much do anything. But people who take the safe route all the time, mm. they end up landing in places they don't like to be and then they end up becoming miserable about it. And I just think that's a, a poor way to live your life. Mm, such such a relevant perspective, especially right now, Brandon, man, like people at home, you know, some of them are scared. Some of them are in the midst of job loss and in the midst of other things. But you, you, you knew you're like, I'm going to do something significant. And I, I can only imagine maybe like, I don't know when and where and how, but when the opportunity presents itself, you wanted to be ready to strike to save money. Dude, like with, so you're saving this money here and you're putting money aside and you're ready to push. What was it like? You know, when you, when you exit or, or, or were kicked out of that first business, what lessons did you really develop or learn along those ways? Well, the first lessons was uh, I, I was able to get this business owner to sell me half of his business for a note. 600000 I had to pay him within three years, which means I had to increase the value of the business. He wanted to retire, so we cut that deal. And I got a nominal salary, like eighty grand, And, and um and I busted my ass and, and then I knew that I could go because these customers of mine were retiring and just shutting their businesses down. So I went down in the US and put a whole bunch of them under letter of intent that I could acquire them for like nothing. Mm -hmm. And I went back to, the, to this guy who had some public companies and I said, look what I can do. And he said, let me help you. And he said, you got to go raise a million dollars so you can hire an executive team. And he kind of laid it out for me and he became my first like mentor on what I need to do. But I made 112 presentations and I was literally laughed out of like almost all of them. Wow. But I just kept questioning myself. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? What, what did I observe? What would I try to do differently? And I kept creating this different approach until one day a dude's like falling asleep in my presentation and he was, ran a half a billion dollar fund in, in North Van and, and I hit the table and I said, look, I can bore you with another presentation or you can jump in my car tomorrow morning. I'll go show you a business. I can buy this doing 1.2 million and I can buy it for $200,000 and it's going to have 300,000 of assets. And he looked at me and he goes, how many of those can you buy? And I said, as many as I want. He said, I'll join you in the morning. And he wrote me a check for my first million that next night. But it took all those rejections to perfect my pitch, to get somebody to listen to me. And instead of having a victim mindset and giving up when I was getting told, you know, you're an idiot. No one would ever give you money. You don't know shit. Why would I give, you know, and I was going all over Canada, Toronto and, and Quebec and, and, Nor and everywhere trying to raise money, getting laughed out of everywhere. So, so the first lesson is the moment you give up, you're done. Mm. Mm. And, how, and how did you end up? Because you're, you're American, right? How, how did you end up in Canada, you know, doing the business? Was just more Because he was the only guy that was willing to do the deal. I was talking <laughs> to business owners everywhere, but it just so happened he wanted to retire in Palm Springs. I was an okay golfer, so we were on the golf course. And, he, and, and, and uh, he's like, dude, I want to take my wife, go down to Palm Springs, but she's running the business, so we can't get out of here. I said, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'll come in and run the business if you cut this deal with me and give me a couple years. And then if I make it big enough, maybe you can teach me how to like do the public company stuff. And he said, dude, that's, if you want to do that deal, I'll do that deal. But it, hmm. I presented that to hundreds of people. And, and again, I was rejected in most of them. He took me serious. And then we parlayed that into a very successful venture. The moral of the story is, like I said, when you give up pursuing your goal, when you give up having your big picture and you're willing to go all in to get there and preparing yourself for that moment, um, then it doesn't happen. So you have to know what you want. You have to be willing and committed to go after it. And then you got to create the conditions for it to happen. Hmm. Well, you know, Grant's got this saying, which I think is one of your favorite saying is don't be a little bitch, right? Just don't do it. You got to keep pushing even when they say no. A lot of people start these small businesses, man. They struggle to ever make a million dollars in revenue. What, what sets you apart that you go towards something where you're going to exit this thing for, you know, is it, is it the education, the schooling that you went to, or what, what sets your mind on this track or this type of business versus let's say a small business that doesn't have this kind of projection? 
Well, just, you know, so we're clear, I'm a 2.4 high school graduate. I didn't have an education. I learned everything by, by getting abused and making huge mistakes and realizing having enough introspective perspective to say, what did I do wrong? What did I do right? But, 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 but I was on such a hard charge run when I launched that first business and I had so much success that I got a little too cocky. And this is the thing, you know, success can mask the things you don't know. And so fortunately, you know, when the business was sold, I made two, four or five tactical mistakes that had I not made it, I would have been worth 50 or a hundred million dollars. So it, it took uh, being with one of my mentors and playing golf with them and complaining about how the private equity guys prematurely sold the business and complaining about, you know, how unfair it was and being a little bitch and being a little drainer that my buddy took me aside, Hector Lamarck. And he said, dude, I love you, but I am, I am about self-creation and you're being a freaking drainer. And if you keep being a drainer, I, I, don't, I won't spend time with you. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, he said, you need to flip the narrative. You need to change your mindset. You need to lean into, look at the remarkable things that you were able to do with no experience and no knowledge and no education. Make a list of what you did wrong. Make a list of everything you did right. And then commit to yourself that you'll never repeat the things you did wrong and turn those wrongs into an asset. Take it off the liability and put it onto an asset page. And then teach everybody not to make those mistakes. Like recalibrate your thinking so your talking follows your thinking and then your doing will follow your talking and then your legacy will be created. And in that moment on the golf course, I wrote every note of everything he said. We talked for a half hour and went home and bought, he said, you got to download or buy Beyond Positive Thinking by Dr. Robert Anthony. I immediately flipped my talk track, track and turned all my liabilities into assets. And then I formulated a business strategy saying, I'm going to exemplify this, never do this by teaching all the other business owners never to do this and do more of this, created a model to do that and went out and started talking to business owners and immediately found there was a huge appetite for what I was talking about. And then I built a business by helping independent individual business owners build their businesses. I didn't even own their businesses. I just came up with a monetization strategy to where I could win when they won and everyone won together. And we built a huge business system uh, where I could run their businesses for them and they could capture the value, the enhanced value that they created instead of selling to somebody or bringing on partners. And I taught them how to do that. And it was like our businesses we manage outperform their peer group three and a half to 15 times in value, even at exit price. I mean, we had businesses that joined us that were doing two or 3 million that we sold them for 30 to 50. Mm. Wow, dude. Wow. That's powerful. This is powerful. What, what are some of those? And you don't have to go into detail, but maybe give us a, a couple key items. Like what, where do people go wrong in, in their valuation or in their ability to sell their companies or scale? their? Yeah. And, uh, and so everybody understands, I mean, even Cardone Ventures, you know, we were on track to do about 18 million in our first year of revenue. And I started it halfway through last year. So, you know, following the principles that I have with building and scaling businesses, when COVID hit, I already had enough reserve that we're still hiring people. We've doubled our employees and our output because we're helping more businesses. We're not worried about monetizing our business because we're building relationships, helping business owners monetize their business in times of need, which means they're going to do more business with me. But let me be clear. Bill, so if you go, uh, have you ever watched Dancing with the Stars? A little bit, not too okay, much. Okay, so I have three daughters. So this analogy is what I like to use. Imagine you walk in and your kids are work, work watching the first show of Dancing with the Stars. Do you have to ask who the experts are and who the star is or will you be able to watch, just observe it and immediately know who the star is and who the expert is? I would say it's pretty clear where the drama and the data is in that case. Yeah. Now, let's assume you don't watch anything. You come to the last show. You're going to have to ask somebody who's the star and who's the expert. Sure. Yep, I can see that. This is, to answer your question, why people get stuck at a million dollars, here's the issue. People start their business, Gerber talks about this in E-Myth, it's still true 40 years later. People start their business because they're technically good at something they enjoy doing it. Mm. That's been on the first episode of Dancing with the Stars. Mm -hmm. How many people are involved with the development of a star to get them on the last show? Mm. You've got the choreographer, You've got a physical trainer, you have a makeup artist, you have a stylist, you have a mental coach, you have a strength coach, you have a massage therapist, you have 
functional medicine for shit that they knock out a joint or break. You have mental, th- like, like there's like 14 or 18 people that help one person go from the first show to look like an expert on the last show. Mm. So the answer to your question is how many of these business owners have access to a group of 15 people that are all, all experts in their area of expertise who have one mission and that is to get that person to the last show. There's no distraction. There's no confusion. There's no lines of authority crossed. They all know their job is to get those people to that last show. Then they have a partner who is making them look better. Now, here's the question these entrepreneurs all need to ask themselves. When a customer experiences them for the first time, are they watching the first show or the last show? Whoa, that's powerful. Well, that's the problem. Mm-hmm. They're watching the first show. Yeah. Because that's all the entrepreneur knows. Now, if an entrepreneur happens to get good and hire some good people and all of a sudden they're 4 million or 6 million, see, here's something to an expert that, that we understand. From zero to 3 million, it's all about what you can do as an individual and then how you can grab a couple people. As soon as you top out at 3 million, from 3 to 8 million, it's going to be about what kind of systems you put in place and how you replicate the best things you do. From eight to 15 million, it's about the processes and amplifying everything you do through more people. 15 to 25, it's about the systems that you bring into place. 25 to 50, it's about the experts you're able to attract into your organization and getting them to work together as functional leaders, doing things in your business culturally, operationally, financially. All those breakpoints are different expertise. And every 30 to $50 million breakpoint after that is a whole new experience, up to a billion and a half dollars. Here's a beautiful thing. When I sold my business, I didn't sell it on what I was doing. I was smart enough. If you understand how buyers buy and you understand how investors invest, then you can understand how to dictate the value of what you've created. So now you can create value differently than the world's telling you you have to do it. When I went to sell my business, I went to eight people that I said, if you bought me and you put me in your businesses doing these things, I'll add an extra billion dollars of value for you. So I want 20% of that for my business. That was my starting pitch. Not here's my revenues, here's my EBITDA, here's why you should buy me. It was if you bought me and I did these things for you, you're going to add a billion dollars and I want 20%. So I started with a $200 million purchase price and systematically got laughed out of all eight of those until I got down to the last three who all said, hmm, maybe it's not 200, but he's definitely got a point. Hmm. So I sold on the benefit I would bring to them. Now, fast forward, public company buys me at 77 times EBITDA. They get mocked by their peers. The analysts, financial analysts say they're insane and yet their stock price was $16.25 when they bought us and it had been there for three years and within 18 months, it was 53. So they added 3 billion to their market cap. Hmm. So it was a great deal for them and it was a great deal for us. Wow. So, so let's just dissect this. This is powerful. And by the way, if you guys are interested in real estate investing and you are in Canada, I wrote a book here called Real Estate Secrets Exposed. Learn how to actually make money virtually, which is cool, from the comfort of your home. Yes, it is possible if you understand the value and how to do wholesaling. And if you don't know anything about wholesaling, you need to grab this book. It's absolutely free. There's no page numbers. There's nothing else in there. It's just ready to go, though. Humble.ceo to grab your free copy. So a couple of things you said. We're talking about Michael E. Gerber here, the E-Myth. So um, what, what you're saying essentially is that folks are getting stuck. And if I understand this you know, correctly, I'm, my understanding is they're getting stuck at that technician phase. They're not really migrating to that management phase. They're definitely not thinking as the entrepreneurial mode. So that's why they're getting stuck at this point, which I fully agree with you. At which stage of the game, and, and I want you to answer this, do the mentorship really matter? Do you think companies need to jump in there as a technician and see if they've got a proof of concept before they hire a mentor? Or do you think a company should jump in right away and just get a mentor in that space and obviously start from a position of counsel and authority versus a position of just experimenting R&D and so forth? Because there's a lot of different kind of thought on this. Where's, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of bad guidance and advice. So I think that who you align with is probably more critical than than when. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of business owners, I tell them, you know, you shouldn't be looking to do anything. If you want to own your business, you need to go out and grow it to a million dollars by yourself first before you try to hire people and do things. There's a, there's a staged process. And I took a kid who was doing $5,000 a month last year in June 
And I laid it out exactly. His name's Matthew Buchanan. And I laid it out exactly. Here's exactly what you do. And this month he did 162,000 and hired his first two people because I have a rule of three. You go from one to three. You don't go from one to two. And so he followed my rules and took $5,000 month production and incrementally been increasing it to where he did 150,000 this month. If you, if you are listening to someone that knows how to grow, so, so you got start, you have scale and you have scaling. Those are three completely different things. So different mentors for different things. Mm. And, and Gerber's is about, hey, while you're doing your thing, so if you follow Gerber's principle, you start a business and you, you write down, if you're baking bread, you write down your recipes, how you greet your customers. So as you go to a million dollars, you have a blueprint of exactly how you got there. Yeah. Then you take, you don't go and dish it off. You go and say, okay, now I'm taking a hundred. Now this is where you move from Gerber to other authors mm. because he doesn't get into it. But there's a process, a methodology, and as you start going through it, by the time you're three million, you got to start reading 21 years of laws of leadership with John Maxwell because you don't know how to lead a team. 17 laws of teamwork. You got to understand concepts of leading team members. Most business owners, the first mistake they make when they add people is they abdicate. Hey, I need you to take care of the accounting. I need you to take care of my marketing. I need you. To, I'm going to go back and do what I love and cook in the back kitchen because I'm not going to share with anybody what my recipes are. And then your accounting's jacked up and somebody's stealing from you and your marketing sucks because nobody knows what the secret sauce is. And you happen to be great at cooking and baking. So your business becomes big. Then you think I've got a system here that I can franchise and then you go and tell people and then they give you money and then they can't replicate it because no one knows what they're doing and then they sue you and then your employees leave and it's like it's just train wreck until you navigate and figure all these things out from zero to three, three to eight, eight to 15, 15 to 25 and, and I map it for every single business and say here's exactly what you need to do and here's what you're going to deal with and here's how you overcome it. Mm -hmm. But there is nobody that does this work. And so you go to consultants. Look, why would I ever hire a consultant to teach me to grow and scale if they're working for themselves? Like, yeah. That's an a, accountant. Yeah, is it, the counselor is their advice at that point. So, so you're essentially, if I get this correctly, it's, it's not enough to just study Michael E. Gerber, follow the process. There's another Michael out there. There's another Michael. And you have to keep developing and keep moving with certain mentors in the space where they may have counselor authority. So is that essentially what you guys really focus on is, is that overarching kind of viewpoint of where the different mentorship pieces come in play or where does, where does, uh, you know, where does the 10X coaching kind of model? Yeah. So, well, Cardone Ventures, we're, you know, we, we platform businesses. We, we teach business owners what each of those stages of breakpoints are relative to their business. We give them the exact structure to operate through those breakpoints because most entrepreneurs like me in my first business learn from their mistakes, from their pain. No business goes like this. Yep. So usually as a business grows and breaks and then they restructure, if they go backwards and say, what decisions did I make that caused the business to break? And then they do it and formulate it different and then they grow again. And so the business will go like this and like this and like this. And you can overlay those on those break points. And I can tell you 80% certainty, which each of those elements are because we've done it so many times through so many businesses. Um, but you need different. So you're right. You need leadership. So, so there's three elements to business. You have belief, you have operational effectiveness, and you have leadership. First, me leadership, then we leadership. And when all those things are operating at seventh and eighth, you know, in a race car, if I'm driving a race car and, and they ask me, how hard am I pushing the car? And I say five tenths, it means the car is only operating at half of what I think it can operate. Mm. It, that makes sense, right? Yep, absolutely. If they ask me how the driver's doing and I say I'm nine tenths, it means the car still could do twice as much, but I'm capped out as a skilled driver. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So if I say I'm, I'm five tenths, the car's nine tenths, it means I'm a better driver than my car can handle. So they need to upgrade the stuff on the car. That, like that concept makes sense, right? Yeah. The same is true for the business and the business owner. Businesses are sometimes running at nine tenths and owners are running at five tenths. They're just kind of coasting and they're kind of comfortable, but the business is on the teeter of breaking yeah. and they don't know what those indicators look like. Or sometimes the business is running on two tenths and the owner's running on nine tenths because they're great at what they do and they're flailing around and they're busy, busy, busy. And it's so chaotic that they feel like it's completely entirely out of control and everyone around them feels like it's out of control. So they can't build the team. So belief, operational effectiveness, and leadership 
And when me leadership is developed, then transferring to we leadership, it's at that two to three million mark where you got to learn to find, attract, develop, and align key people to take on those elements that allow your business to grow and scale. That's a totally different technique than baking the bread in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. What I love about that is it's almost, it's a tactical blueprint. A lot of people think it's guesswork and, and putting it together, but it seems that there's an actual genuine formula there. And it sounds almost like, you know, it's a parlay between the, the owner's effectiveness and, and what his role is maybe his unique abilities, maybe his opportunities and so forth, his mindset development. And then there's the company. So if it, I'm sure there's at some point where there's a breaking point where, hey, the owner's no longer positioned or he's no longer effective as a leader with where the company's going. So maybe it's time that you're no longer the CEO. Maybe you got to take a different seat. Maybe you got to change or maybe you got to push yourself to develop. Do you see this disparity a lot with, with companies and owners where maybe the owners aren't prepared or maybe the company isn't prepared for the owner? I see all variations of that. Family businesses, billion dollar businesses, half million dollar businesses, uh, the business has so much because that's what the work we do. Once we do the competitive analysis, the market demographic overlays, the comparative for business sectors, all the research, and you're sitting there huffing and puffing, thinking you're completely maxed out doing 1.2 million. And I show you a peer who's doing 4.2 million in the same market, same number of employees, doing the exact same thing, same transaction values. At that point, you're looking at that and saying, I'm working harder, not smarter. Hmm. Hmm. So, but, but there isn't, I'll be clear, Ben, uh, most people figure this out as they go along because there really isn't a unified expertise to bring this to people. There's all these consultants and advisors and programs and books, but it's really through a lot of experience. And, and, and I have a lot of experience, but I also have a dynamic experience with teams, with a team of people that I kept with me because everyone has their expertise. So just like Dancing with the Stars, we have our finance expertise, our demographics expertise, our technical expertise. We have our valuation expertise. We have our marketing expertise and then sub-marketing expertises. All those people, strategy, structure, all the data, how you aggregate it, how you overlay it, how you collect it, how you formulate it. Like those are all different people with different expertises. Mm -hmm. So when a business owner can tap into that, like the dancing with the star star can tap into those 14 people that are all working together with their area of expertise with a very strong understanding of what the deliverable looks like. It gets formulated properly. What happens with most business owners is as they go through trials, tribulations, adding people that don't really know what they're talking about, hiring people that aren't necessarily really good at things, trying to get everybody to cooperate and coordinate and, and lead together. All those nuances are what keep people pushed down until they break through. And then when they break through, they go to 8 million and then to 12 million and then to 25 million. But when I'm talking to a business owner at those thresholds and I'm mentioning it, they're like, yep, 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 yep. Check, 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 check. I spent a million dollars surveying 3,800 businesses across uh, 75 different sectors to get this data to validate what my assumptions were. And then we executed and launched a company to prove it and, and we're proving it. People that are nine, 10 months with Cardone, even during COVID-19 are seeing doubles and triples of growth in their businesses following and executing to these strategies. Hmm. And so we know we have a secret sauce here to, to and, and my, my, deal with Grant is we're going to create a multi-billion dollar fund of these owner-operator businesses. You know, if you're, if you're doing 3 million in revenue making 500 grand a year and you go to sell your business, they're going to offer you three times or four times EBITDA. Yep. If you're part of a group where there's 250 people doing 3 million each, I could take that group public and you could sell 20% of your business for twice as much as you'd sell 100% of your business for. That's what private equity companies do. That's what roll-up strategies do. That's what I did in audiology. Brought so much value to the enterprise by operationalizing the absolute best of the best and creating so much value for them that they were able to sell a fraction of their business for three to five times more than they'd sold a whole business for before we got involved. And so my mission is to bring value to people's personal, professional, and financial life by teaching them to create value for their teams. Hmm. So, wow. Wow. There's so much to touch on here, man. I, I, I love this conversation. Hey, it's Ben Humble. Thanks for checking out the show. If you like what my guest is talking about and you're getting massive value from it, then scroll to the bottom, open up the description, and follow them on social media. Support them, connect with them. Just scroll down there, click the link, and let's roll. Stay humble. 
So a couple things I want to, you know, maybe you can articulate for me is any business, because I mean, there's different types of business from, you know, the red ocean businesses that are, you know, bloody pools of competition. Then you got the blue ocean businesses, you know, is any business really uh, can follow the same process or is it industry specific? Is it, is there any elements, you know, to that, that may, may differ business to business. I say anybody that's created a million dollar business, they can follow those elements. So you got to get, in my mind, you know, you can start out at 5,000, but it doesn't matter what it looks like at a million or 3 million or 8 million or 15 million if you don't get to a million. So mm -hmm. I can teach somebody to go from zero to a million as easily as I can teach someone to go from a million to a hundred million. The problem is a million to a hundred million is going to require a whole bunch of people helping them. And that's just not a skill set that's developed until you're 20 or 30 or 40 million. Mm -hmm. You don't even know what it looks like. And usually you're pulling the people that, that you hired in the early days with you. None of them know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Everybody's guessing. Everyone's practicing. No one wants to expose their weaknesses. And you got to shuffle through all that. And then when you realize it, you bring outsiders in and realize no cultural alignment. Mm -hmm. No one can work with them. They're arrogant. They maybe lied about how technical skills they really were. You got to cycle through those people, pay yeah. severances because they're big deal. You know, you got to get through all that to get to 25 million and then 50 and then 100. And so very few businesses get through those breakpoints because it's just easy to retreat and be comfortable or they go dilute themselves with private equity like I did. And then they end up losing their companies and get screwed out of their life's work and getting really bitter. Mm. But to go down this journey here, just to clarify, I mean, I, I see businesses in kind of two buckets, the enterprising business and the lifestyle business. So you got the folks who just growing it for themselves to provide some family money and, you know, really is about them at the end of the day. And then the enterprising business are the ones that are built to sell. Do you think a company has to build it as an enterprising? Do you think in those capacities or, or is any business, regardless of its structure and so forth, you know, capable and, and able to go down this route at some point? Every business that can get to a million can become an enterprise. Everyone. Okay. Okay. So huh. I've never seen if it's a product or if it's a service or if it's a technology platform. If you can get to a million, that means there's a need of whatever you're doing. Right. You just have to be smart enough about how you productize. So if you're a speaker and you're doing, I have a buddy that does a million and a half dollars a year in speeches. Hmm. What happened to us? He was high on the hog man, crushing it commanding big speaker fees, doing a remarkable job. And what happened, what happened to his speaking business when COVID-19 hit? Did it die? Well, no Did one, it? you can't even get a group together. So it went to zero. Yeah. Everyone canceled this year. So I put a program in place. Boom. He's back up. He just, mm -hmm. he pivoted to a whole different thing, doing virtual meetings mm -hmm. with key executives on a top, on taking all his content down to some very specific content that people need right now. He just, he just needed to, isolate. Now when everything comes back and he does his speaking, he'll also have the consultative business. Now he'll be three times bigger. Mm. Now his art is now to transfer that to some of the people that he needs to develop. So now it can become 10 times bigger. But where there's a need and where there's, uh, uh, um, I say that anywhere where you can identify a problem and solve that problem, the bigger the problem and the better you can solve it, the more value there is for everyone involved. And, and, to, and that was a walnut orchard thing. The problem was proving to their kids they loved them. So therefore, they picked them. They were happy to do it. They cleaned them. They were happy to do it. And they bought them for way over what they were worth. They were happy to do it. Everyone won because it wasn't about what they did. It was about the intent behind doing it. Most business owners think that what they do is so important. But once you're over a million dollars, it's no longer the most important thing. Who you do it with and how you do it becomes important because... All the people you add to that equation will either undermine you and undermine what you're doing or they'll exemplify it. Now, you have to make a choice. Do you want to allow new people to undermine the thing that's working or do you want them to exemplify it? Because that's the only thing you can control is how you bring them into the business and teach them to exemplify it. If you abdicate and say, here's your role, you just figure it out, they're going to undermine it because they're not you. And if they were, they wouldn't be working for you. That's number one law in 21 irrefutable laws, law of the lid. Anybody that's higher lid than you isn't going to work for you. So you're always hiring down, which means you have to train up. Mm. Mm. So is there, is there a need, essentially, is there a need to fill? 
So, so a company shows up, it's a million dollar company. You've got, you're aggregating all these other businesses here. Is it one industry specific for you guys, you know, with, with ventures or is there, is that need there, but maybe as small business owners, it's just not that easily visible. Like, like I give an example, somebody has got a, let's say a coaching or enterprising company that way. And they want to help people mentorship. Is there some large conglomerate that's looking to swallow up these smaller coaching businesses? Or is it your job to go into the marketplace and try to essentially create those opportunities? Or does that opportunity already kind of exist in your opinion? Um, I think there's so many opportunities and there's so many people that are successful doing so many different things. I, the first thing I like to use research. So if somebody comes to me and they're, they're a half a million, a million, 10 million, a hundred million, I don't care. And they say, here's what I do. The first thing I do is I take the sick codes. So no, most people don't even know what data is. I take the sick code, which is the, the what, what they're defined by as an industry. And I go to my half a million dollar a year database and I start pulling everybody that does what they do. So I have comparative data to what they're doing. And all of a sudden I see it's a billion dollar or a $3 billion industry. And yet they're talking about going from a half a million to 750,000. That's their big move. It's like, why aren't you talking about going to, you know, a hundred million? Mm. And they're like, oh, I just can't even fathom it with all the stuff I have to do now, of course. But if you had to fathom it, yeah. what would it look like to you? So, so we can take businesses that are working and we can teach them just like the kid that's doing the social media stuff at $5,000 a month. I mean, he never, never had a, a vision. He thought he had to hire 50 people to go to 2 million. Mm. He's at three now and he's, he's annualizing at 1.8 million according to this last month. And every month it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. So, so if you're good at what you do or great at what you do, and then you become excellent at who you're doing it with and teaching them how to do it, to do it well, your business will grow and scale. But the technical aspect of that, it's like, do you want to go and teach yourself how to dance so you can get on Dancing with the Stars? And then do you want to go it alone to try to get on the final episode versus all the support that's being helped? Well, right. what I rock, the big need was from my standpoint, there's nobody that does the work I do. There's a lot of I, I haven't heard I haven't heard a lot of companies. I mean, there's obviously like you said, coaches and mentors and people who who come in as consultants and help companies grow and add executive level management and all these other things. But yours concepts is 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 quite different. And so that's just something that you you've created with 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 Grant as a as a blue ocean thing. Or well, I created it because it's what I've been doing for the last 25 years. I've just, I've just progressed it. You know, I set up a separate holding company. This is another important thing. Sharon Lecter and I talked about this on my 10X Live, Owners Live, which I'm going to do tomorrow night. No, 10X Owners Live is tonight. It's Tuesday. I do it at 5 p.m. We're going to talk about firing and hiring because this is a big subject people are having right now. But um, it's 5 p.m. Pacific time. Um, you go to cardomitchers.com forward slash... Um, um, Let's see. Uh, just go to cardoventures.com we'll, we'll and register. Up. We'll yeah. throw it up on this. Yeah, just cardoventures.com and, and yeah. you can register for it if you want to participate. Perfect. But um, the the and plus, I just put out my response book, my uh, the emergency business response book, because I've been helping so many business owners. I took all the things that they were struggling with and put it into a. Uh, a book that's got 14 chapters of exactly how to deal with it. So you can uh, go to counteradventures.com and you can download the ebook. Mm. Um, but Let's the point on here is, on there. Uh, I lost track with your question. What was your question again? Yeah, you were talking about Sharon Lecter and you were talking about, um, you know, like this is kind of a thing that just you're doing in, in essence. Yeah, like yeah. So, so, so here's the, thing. I mean, the quality of the results you try to attain will be relative to the quality of questions you ask. Mm. And the quality of the response that's taught to you and given to you. Uh, when I went out and did my research, see, I was always a closed industry guy. Allergy, audiology, ENT, dental. You had to be in my ecosystem to know who I was and what I was doing. I never thought about social media. This is why when Natalie said, you know, if you want to go mash, you should look at some of these social media guys. So I looked at the top guys and the only person I found that had a real business that was doing things for people directly with a product was Grant and, you know, world's greatest sales coach with, with, you know, doing hundred million dollars of sales training with all these industries. So I cross-referenced those industries to my list. I did a million dollars of research with FTI and IGS, the same companies private equity groups use and identified hundreds of verticals we could help. And I cross-referenced that to what Grant was doing and 60% of the people he's doing sales training on are on my list of businesses I can help. So you have to be, you have to have a formula. You have to have a strategy. You have to have intentional act, actions. You got to know what your key performance indicators look like. You got to know these things. You can't 
that just, you know, the people that just wander in and start doing stuff, they tend to frail, you know, flail around and, and, and when pressure gets on, they bail out or they stay small. So the more you can be intentful about what you're looking for, the more you can find the right mentors to solve that particular problem. Remember I gave you the list of all the screw ups I made uh, when I had my first company? One of the things I realized is I was not a good leader. So I found John Maxwell, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. By the time I was done, I had all his 53 laws all into an algorithm that I used for, for teaching and coaching and training leadership. Jim Collins on Great by Choice, How the Mighty Fall, Good to Great. I realized that Bert Gerber can make you from small to understand the concepts, but then what makes great businesses great and what makes great businesses collapse? So I had to study that body of work. So taking Gerber and Jim Collins and Sharon Lecter with, with Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then Cashflow Quadrant, taking Robert Anthony, Beyond Positive Thinking, John Maxwell's leadership books, all of a sudden taking all those books and mashing them together to solve all the mistakes I made and saying, aha, I made that mistake. This is what they say about it. But mm. equally taking all the things I did well and mapping them to the things they say you should do to con create confidence. Now, then I went out and launched a whole nother company to practice that across thousands of businesses that I crushed it with those business owners teaching them all this. And today, you don't need to read all those books and understand all the mistakes and make all those mistakes because I'm going to tell you, here's the mistakes I made and here's what I did to fix it. Here's the body of work and here's my body of work to bridge it. And people are like, sail forward, man, execute. Mm. And I partnered with Grant because I loved in the 10X rule about massive action, being accountable. Yep. Don't be a little complainer. Don't be a little bitch. You know, you hey, have- don't be a bitch. <laughs> yeah, don't be a bitch. Like, and people are like, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't say that. And I say, to put it in context. Yeah. You ever sat over the water crew with the employee that's like, I know, but it just is horrible and I don't want to do it and I don't like the meetings and I don't like my boss and I don't want to have to work extra hours and all that, I call it drainers. It's like, it's like you know, Gallup poll says out of 100 million Americans, we'll pick on the Americans instead of the Canadians, but out of 100 million <laughs> Americans, 28% are actively engaged. The, the middle third are disengaged and the bottom third are actively disengaged. They're actually sabotaging your business. Now, you can be a victim or you can intentfully create actively engaged, highly aligned, highly inspired employees that want to grow and build with you. True leadership is making other people's success easy. To the extent you do that, you'll collect better followers. So if you have a bunch of drainers, it's law of mirror. It's a John Maxwell law. You look in the reflection of the mirror, whatever you're getting back is, is an indication of what you're putting in. It's law of circulation. What you put out, you get more of back. So if you got drainers in your organization, it's because you are being a drainer. Wow. Wow. If you want highly aligned, highly intentional, highly purposeful, highly direct contributors, then you be that person and that's all you'll collect into your system because opposites cannot attract. They will eat themselves up. So if you have a business that's got a bunch of mediocre people in it that are just like always looking for excuses, it's because you've created those conditions. You want something different? Change your mind to change your business, change your conditions. Your business will grow and scale and everyone, including your team, will prosper, including your customers. Hmm. Starts with you. I'm giving you another bomb there. That starts with you. Such a powerful lesson, man. I, I really appreciate you sharing this stuff because you know what? A lot of times we don't talk about it like this. This level of you know, I'm not going to say information. This level of thought isn't really that readily available to folks, right? It's no, like, I'll it start isn't. a business, get going. And, and then from there, it's like, we, we don't really know what we don't know. We live in this ignorant bubble. And yeah, there's, there's this Wall Street somewhere and there's this, but it, we're, so, we're so disconnected from that reality. It's like, how do you ever bridge that gap? And what you're doing for, for our audience and for, and for us is just, you're helping us understand that bridge and it's just powerful. What, what can people, what should people do? Like right now they got a half million dollar, million dollar business. They're like, you know what? This sounds phenomenal. What's next? What should they do, my friend? Yeah, just go to cardonventures.com and, and, and join us tonight for the 10X Live every Tuesday night or Google it and look at the guests I've had on and what we've talked about. Get involved. I have some communities you can get involved. I have as cheap as $995 you can be into a program, uh, which is our, our, our emergency business response book. Look, this isn't just, uh, I'm going to tell you this, almost every business in my career is at some point in an emergency or in a crisis. It doesn't take a crisis to create a crisis. It usually takes poor strategy bad intentions, bad experiences, bad execution, 
Businesses will fall into crisis at all sizes and all ranges. So, so this is something I've been dealing with my whole career and I've accidentally been in a crisis in an emergency. I know how crappy it feels. And so I'm a doctor, I'm executing, I'm a wartime CEO. Like I live in that world all day long because I'm helping everybody else that's struggling in those moments. Go and download the emergency business protocol. Read that. If you just do that, then you can pay $9.95. If, if that information, if you're like, this is deep, this is like, it's an easy read because I'm a simple guy, 2.4 GPA, no college education. I, 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 I had somebody proof it to make sure I didn't look like a complete idiot. But here's the thing. Read that. And if you read that and you go, I can relate to this, pay the $9.95 and get in my six-week mentor program. If, if you work for somebody else and you want to go blow that business owner's mind by, by bringing content and strategy to them that they're not thinking about, practice it there and watch it flourish and then go do it yourself. If you're a solopreneur and you want to crush it, learn these elements because you can help everybody you're talking to and working with break through, add value to these people so they'll want to work with you. And if you're a business owner of any size and you don't want to have a crisis, you don't want to be in an emergency or you are in an emergency, download the book, read it, and just connect with me. And if, if that seems like it's valuable, pay the $9.95 and get to know me and then It'll open your eyes to all the programs we have. I love it. Folks, connect with my man, Brandon. What's the best place they can follow you, man, on social media? Where's, where do you prefer? At Brandon M. Dawson on Instagram. At Brandon M. Dawson on Instagram. Man, so thankful for you and for the knowledge you're sharing. You're dropping bombs after bombs. I think we broke the keyboard on three bombs, so didn't we, we didn't go any further. Hey, it's Ben Humble. Thanks for checking out the show. If you like what my guest is talking about and you're getting massive value from it, then scroll to the bottom, open up the description, and follow them on social media. Support them, connect with them. Just scroll down there, click the link, and let's roll. Stay humble. Make sure to subscribe to Ben on YouTube so you can stay up to date on everything humble. Featuring daily episodes of the Humble Podcast and weekly video content providing motivation, real estate strategies, and personal development for everyday life. Also, follow Ben on Facebook and Instagram for daily interactions. Check out Humble.ceo and download a chapter of Ben's new book, From Communism to Capitalism, absolutely free.